want to be bringing to you Yasmin Juwani. She is going to discuss Canada and it's um, the, the factors how race and media and power and so on have been worked out. Because Canada, at least for African Americans, for the last 200 years has kind of seemed like the promised land. And that seemed that way also for other nationalities who have had long histories of living there and creating a multicultural environment. And so at least for the last 30 years, it seemed like it seems like Canada has this whole multicultural thing worked out. And Yasmin Jawani is here to complicate that understanding for us and give us more uh, detail about that. So here she is from Concordia University in Montreal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to actually stand here because one of the things that I have is a bad habit of, uh, um, of just talking. And, uh, and that's part of the tradition I come from. I come from a very strong oral tradition, which is why uh, technology like this is not something that's, that I'm particularly partial to, but I feel compelled to use it, uh, uh, given the sort of emphasis on technology in most departments. And, but I just want you to bear in mind that if, for some reason, my talk departs from the PowerPoint, ignore the PowerPoint, OK? <laughs> just listen to me. So I'd like to start out with um, uh, thanking John Downing for inviting me here. I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, for allowing me to meet up with people that I've read about, talked about, heard about all these many years. And I want to start out with, uh, with troubling the very notion of what Canada is, okay? And I'm going to do that deliberately, and I'm going to be quite provocative about it, because part of residing in a place like Canada is that you can shout all you want in there, but nobody listens to you. Um, and the reason for that is twofold. One, I want to show you the sheer landmass of this country. It's huge. It basically takes you about six or seven hours to fly from one end of the country to the other, to fly. Uh, and, that's, and if you want to drive, you're driving for about five days or four days straight. It's huge. And that means that when you're thinking about media and sort of the national imaginary, the kind of media that, that needs to be there in order to create an identity for the nation, the media that you need to project a national imaginary, it's a really complicated job when you're dealing with a landmass this size and a demographic population that's a lot smaller. So one of the things that used to really amaze me about this country is that I grew up in British Columbia, which is at the far end. But the, the population of British Columbia was the size of England. Okay? The, the, the landmass is, is huge. But the population was a lot less. And so what we're looking at is a population that is strung like a necklace very thinly across this country. And it's, it's not as populated as the States is. It's not as populated as, as the UK is or Europe is. And so consequently, there are stretches of land that you don't see anyone. It's, it's huge that way. I'm going to jump a little bit and tell you a bit about the media scenario over there because that's one of the reasons why this, this country has such a complex character. It has one of the highest levels of media concentration in the world. There are about four major companies that own uh, pretty much all the newspapers in the country and all the radio stations and all the television stations. Take that into consideration and, and sort of juxtapose it with the reality that about 85% of our entertainment uh, television viewing comes from the US. All right? So we're really bombarded with uh, an American picture, which doesn't necessarily ma you know, match up with our reality. But at the same time, we have scarce resources to develop our own realities. So we've got a string of communities across you know, a media concentration um, issue where most of these papers, and the only place I know that has a majority in terms of independent papers is up in the, in the Yukon Territory. 
that's far up north, and Nunavut to some extent. But most of these places, the major cities across all of these provinces, are basically um, served by newspapers owned by one or two chains. And we have two national papers, one of which is owned by Ken West, which is the National Post. It's the right wing paper. And we have a right of center paper, the Globe and Mail, which is owned by the uh, Globe Media Corporation, which is another sort of major corporation that also owns the television stations. So it's a, it's a very sort of complicated scenario because there is the development of a national identity, but it's an, it's an identity that's developed often in opposition to the US, right? So we're the other. But it's also developed within the country in opposition to the minorities that are there. And that's what I'd like to turn to. Now, Canada has this image that it projects itself um, of a multicultural nation. Um, and it's an image also of the nation as a sort of middle power country. It, we're not a superpower. We're quite, I think, quite proud to be a middle power. We're actually a nation that has a reputation of being peacekeepers. So we, we're, we go where we're called and we serve humanity, right? It's that kind of sort of benevolent picture. And in, in terms of sort of minority group mythologies, there's also the mythology that we were the sort of like, um, uh, where the freedom train ended for slavery and a sort of a home and a haven for a lot of displaced groups in the world. Displaced groups because who are refugees, etc. And one of the things that this, uh, you know, that sort of feeds into this notion is the, the multicultural ideology. And there's an argument, or historically one can say, well, multiculturalism began in 1971 when it was first articulated by the, our previous, previous Prime Minister, Pierre Trudeau, or that it was legislated in 1988. But the roots of the kind of multiculturalism culturalism we have actually date back to the turn of the century. And I want to quote uh, verbatim one of our early prime ministers who said at the turn of the last century, he said, the cathedral is made of marble, oak, and granite. It is the image of the nation I would like to see Canada become. For here, I want the marble to remain marble, the granite to remain granite, the oak to remain oak, and out of all these elements, I would build a nation great among the nations of the world. That's the roots of the multicultural ideology. But if you look at it very carefully, part of it was the whole notion of separate but equal progress or equal division. And that's the notion of the mosaic. And in fact, Canada has been described as a cultural mosaic. Now, very astute social scientists have come along and shown that it's not really just a mosaic. It's actually a vertical mosaic. And it's a vertical mosaic because within the country, there is a definite pattern, particularly in immigration statistics, that actually reflect the kind of preferred immigrants that Canada wants to draw. And this notion of preferred immigrants becomes really important in defining who's a Canadian, right? Who can actually achieve the status of a bona fide Canadian? And that's why I had to laugh a little today when I saw the poster, because I had, I had to laugh when I thought of what my colleagues would say in terms of me representing Canada. I would certainly not be classified as the bona fide Canadian, all right? So it has this, this sort of ranked structure. And in a way, the whole sort of cycle of immigration the settlement of the country was actually predicated on this hierarchy of preferred immigrants. So the way in which immigration worked was to actively recruit communities that would come and do a particular function, fulfill a particular function in the making of the country. That meant, along with the dis displacement and genocide of Aboriginal people, it actually meant bringing in people, say for instance from Eastern Europe, who were known to be uh, you know, known to have a good background in farming to actually farm and settle the prairies, the central regions of the country where a lot of the farming takes place. It meant bringing in um, English nannies to look after the growing population or English brides to be the sort of mothers of the country. And in fact, we have 
we have had a very active uh, chapter of, of the organization called Daughters of the Empire. And the idea being that they would actually sort of like perpetuate what good Canadian stock was supposed to be like. So each, there is a checkered kind of history of migration with different groups being used for different purposes. The Chinese were brought in primarily to be cheap labor, right? And were paid a lot less than white labor in building the, the Canadian Railway, which is the one sort of piece of transportation that links the country from one end to the other. And in fact, was a very major piece in uniting the country as a federation. The uh, black population that came in, and I had a question about this from a student in the hallway, actually came to Canada in the 1800s. And uh, one portion of the black population was actually deported from Jamaica. They had rebelled against the British in Jamaica and were deported from Jamaica into Halifax, which you can imagine what it must have been like, given the worst possible land and uh, ghettoized in that particular area. And this was the beginning of an area called Africville, which was subsequently torn apart. The Indian population was actively recruited by the Canadian Pacific Railway um, to do a certain portion of the work in building the railway, but also in terms of the lumber industry, and got concentrated on, on, the, on the coast of British Columbia, where they did all of, you know, all of that kind of work. What I want to show is that this kind of checkered history actually led to a situation where different provinces had different outgroups. All right? So, for instance, you could be South Asian or Indian in British Columbia will be, will have, you will have a, a reality and an existence that's very different there than if you were to go across the country and reside in Montreal where you're a minority. So where you are makes a big difference in how you understand this land and your relationship to being Canadian in the process. So I want to show you some of the sort of concentrations. And I'm going straight to the issue of race here because one of the things that happens within the multicultural discourse that I want to talk about is that part of this sort of rhetoric of multiculturalism emerged in the forging of Canada as a nation state. But it was very clear that each one of these groups that was brought over you know, would only be tolerated if it did what it was supposed to do. In other words, if it didn't step out of its category, right? So for instance, there was active recruitment of the Hutterites, the Amish. These were communities that were brought over that actually formed enclaves. And what you have in terms of the situation of, across the country are enclaves of different groups that live in a kind of uneasy tension with each other because they're all ranked and everybody knows they're ranked. So for instance, if you're in the top sort of four levels, then you're, you're British, which means in Canada, it could be you're, you're Irish, you're Welsh, you're Scottish, it doesn't matter, you're British. It could mean your next preferred category is French, if you're a French Canadian. And then if you're below that, you have to go into the uh, a category of the Eastern European, so you're Ukrainian, German, Polish, and so forth. And below that, you get into the Italians, and then below that, you get into the people of color. And right at the bottom of this category, this hierarchy, were the aboriginal populations who remain to this day at the bottom of this hierarchy. So this kind of sort of like vertical mosaic has been sustained. And the official articulation of multiculturalism as an ideology has actually served the purpose of not only sort of sustaining this ideology, but actually giving it a kind of resonance and a kind of sort of legitimization in the world today because of the whole sort of ethos of everybody being a multicultural nation. But it's very clearly designed and it has a kind of insidious uh, outcome. Now, one of the things that happens, one of the reasons I want to go to the issue of race is because the language of multiculturalism does two things. When it was first articulated in Parliament, in, in our House or our legislation, as, a, um, as an ideology in 1971, it was done for a particular purpose. And I want to go back to the map of Canada because I want to show you what the tensions were there. How do I go back?
what we what's happened in Canada historically and that still has a sizzling effect on its politics now is that Quebec on one side which was previously French Canada got conquered by the British okay so what happened is that upper and lower Canada combined and the the French got colonized by the British so you have a situation where you have two colonial powers not one right and the other colonial power colonized the first one. So there's, a, there's this notion of who owns what, or who was there first, right? And what belongs to them. And so the French argue that that, that territory, New France, as it was called at that time, actually belongs to them. And the resources therein belong to them. And so they've argued for a recognition of their nation as a separate nation. The whole notion of Quebec, Quebecois separatism actually comes out of that. But it's complicated if you're looking at it from a third perspective because a large portion of Quebec's land mass is actually Aboriginal. All right? And so when Quebec went to the uh, polls for a referendum, the Cree, a dominant Aboriginal group there, also held their own referendum and argued that if Quebec separated from Canada, then they would remain within Canada. And the question became, how much land does Quebec really have? And how much land does the Cree have? But the issue is that the Cree don't have power. And the Quebec government does. And in fact, one of the things that Quebec has managed to do is that it, it not only has its interpretation of multiculturalism, but on top of that, it has its own laws. It controls its own immigration. It follows the Napoleonic laws as opposed to the rest of the country that follows uh, uh, common law, British common law. So that's one of the sort of tensions. The other thing that's sort of very, you know, I don't really believe in national characters, but here I think I do. When I compare the US and Canada, the US had its own Boston Tea Party, okay? It actually went and rebelled against the empire. Canada didn't. Canada remained a dutiful nation to the empire until the empire thought, well, this is getting to be too expensive. We need to let her go, all right? So it was that kind of a relationship. And in fact, the federated nation, that's Canada, composed of all of these different uh, provinces and territories, is very, very fragile that way because they are part, even during the heyday of colonialism, they were part of it, like British Columbia, that wanted to secede at that time. They wanted to leave the Federation and they actually wanted to join with their neighbor in the South in order to be able to create a separate state, which of course the Aryan nations actually then wanted for themselves. So there is sort of like, you know, there are tensions across the country. And the Quebec, the French-English divide is one of the big ones that can consistently manifests itself. And it manifests itself in terms of this call for a referendum, the call for secession, the, um, you know, and the steps that are taken every single time that happens. That's where the issue of minorities comes in and comes in quite strategically. Because one of the things that happens when you've got two warring nations trapped in one body is that they often look for a third agent by which to show themselves up. And so consequently, what the French call cultural minorities and what the English call visible minorities get played out in this process like a strategic football, right? So it's like one side said, oh, look, look how intolerant you are, look how good we are. And the other side said, you know, you're just sort of like, you know, dismembering yourselves in the interests of, of recognizing all this difference. And so each side chooses which minority football it will work with, right? in order to be able to create positive valuations of itself. That aside, one of the things that happens in the language of multiculturalism when it was first articulated was that when uh, Trudeau articulated it, he was very cognizant of the whole French-English tension that was there. So he thought, okay, he'll come up with this policy, and within this policy, he would say that it's a policy that would privilege the two charter groups, as they're called, the English and the French. And so the idea was to appease the French and contain what had now come up and what became known as the third force. 
the sort of like Ukrainian, Polish, German communities across the pra prairies, and that's Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, that were a sizable force and that were saying, hey, you can't just recognize the French. What about us? We've also tilled the land here. We've been, you know, uh, responsible for creating the nation state. And so the policy was actually made up in the interest of containing French nationalism and appeasing this third force. But once the policy was articulated, something different happened. And you can see here the conjuncture of different factors. Immigration criteria changed. And this, by this, they had begun to change in 67, and by 1976, they had shifted over into what's now known as a point system. And a point system is essentially a colorblind system. Because prior to that, before 67, there was a very clearly articulated, racialized immigration policy in effect. And that was something that, like British Columbia, for instance, had forged with South Africa and with Australia at the turn of the century, where they had defined which people, particularly people of color, they were not going to accept, right? And they had to devise some interesting tests by which to do this. So if you were a Chinese-speaking person, which the Australians called rice people at that time, and you had come in, well, one of the things that would happen is that you, an immigration officer would take you into a room and he would ask you to read a passage in English. And then he would ask you some questions. So the, the, the language tests emerged around this time. And of course, nobody could really, nobody else was in that room. So nobody could tell whether you could speak the language or not. So this was basically defined as one of the criteria. The second thing that the country did was it enacted laws. And because of its relationship with the colonial government, with the, with the Home Office in England, it couldn't necessarily say, we don't want any Indians. So what they did is they came up with this policy called the Continuous Voyage Act. And the Continuous Voyage Act said the only way you could settle in the country was if you took a continuous voyage from the nation, your birth nation, or where you lived, all the way to Canada. Which meant that if you were coming from India, you couldn't necessarily take a continuous journey. Or if you were coming from Japan, you couldn't. You would have to stop somewhere to refuel, and then, and only then, could you make that long trek across, right? Well, you obviously couldn't do that. The third thing they did is they imposed a head tax. So they argued that if once the Chinese started coming over, and they didn't want them to come over, they said, all right, every time a Chinese person lands, we're going to impose a $50 head tax which then went up to $100 and then went up to even more. So that was, these are the kind of mechanisms which they used to sort of dissuade immigration from particular countries and retain immigration from the source countries that they preferred, namely Europe. Well, by 76, things had changed, all right? They're, the traditional source countries were drying up, so where were they going to turn for cheap labor? Well, there was no choice but to turn to the third world. And with a point system in effect, which said how many points you got for education, how many points you got for speaking English, and so forth, anyone could come in. And so consequently, immigration itself became a racialized process. Right? So the term immigrant has, has now become synonymous with the person of color. In fact, if you were to, in, my, in some of the research I've done, I've asked young uh, girls, what's, and these are young girls of color, uh, how do you define a Canadian? What's a Canadian? And they'll tell me, it's someone with blue eyes and blonde hair. That's how they see what a Canadian is. That's what's been internalized by them through exposure to the dominant media, through the histories they encounter in the curriculum. And so consequently, these are the sort of ways in which preferred notions of what a Canadian is get communicated. Now, the thing about the multiculturalism ideology combined with this change in immigration patterns meant that the immigrants that were coming in were all these sort of immigrants of color. And so multiculturalism refracted through the race lens became itself racialized. Culture became race, okay? Race became, the way, talking culture became talking race. And it became a code word for race. So in other words, it was like only 
people of color had actually cultures that could be seen, right? We were the only people that had culture. And the dominant society retained a kind of invisible normalcy, a dominance that was continually in the background against which difference was con constantly judged. Well, that kind of racialization resulted in a number of things. I, what happened here? You had a population of racialized groups that actually settled in only the metropolitan areas because there were areas that, was, that were unsafe to live in, literally. I mean, until about five years ago when I left British Columbia, I had people who told me, don't go into this town unless you want to be shot. So that's the kind of sort of environment in which a lot of different parts of the country still remain, right? It's almost a kind of... Um, a rural cowboy kind of effect that happens. But one of the things is that the, the hate groups are exceptionally well organized in a lot of the rural areas. And particularly in British Columbia, there has been a tracking of the movement of arms from the US into British Columbia and a lot of different incidents as a result. So not only did culture get sort of cul uh, race become culturalized, but everything that was racial actually became understood in the language of culture. And so you had those aspects of culture that were visibly different that actually got understood as culture. Not culture as a lived reality, but culture in what, what one theorist has, has labeled as the three Ds. Dense, diet, and um, what else was that? Um, dress. So costume, clothes, I mean costume, dancing, and cuisine. That's how culture became understood. But that's also how legit culture became legitimized as the only acceptable forms of culture that could be allowed. Yeah? And you can see that even in terms of the settling of the country. Because the one common thing that you'll find in a lot of rural areas as you go across this country is the Chinese cafe. The Chinese restaurant became sort of like the sign of the only place in which any kind of visibility of culture was allowed. The rest of culture became privatized. And it became privatized to the point where with the enclaves that already existed, with the kind of sort of strategic settlement patterns that were created, you've got these sort of groups that have turned inward because of the hostility they face outside. So much so that all kinds of cultural practices become so internalized and so privatized that you never see them. And the only things that you see are the sort of the Chinese New Year's Day or the parade that happens here or, you know, cuisine because restaurants are something where culture becomes a commodity that can be consumed more readily, all right? So within the context of multiculturalism, that's how culture became understood. And multiculturalism as, as an ideology became a way by which to manage diversity. And when I'm using the term to manage diversity, I want to bring in the whole focus of this notion of sort of management, you know, the idea that you need to contain it and you can only contain it and diffuse it of any of its transgressive potential by doing a number of things. One was you could contain it in terms of just, just these ethnic restaurants or sort of forms of culture that were consumable, or you could criminalize it, which meant that you could actually sort of contain it in prisons, right? That was another way. The other way was that you could contain it by erasing the group entirely. And a part of the whole process of doing this was through what Melinda de Jesus, I love her concept, that I, so I keep using it, calls the fictions of assimilation. So you gave people, particularly in these groups, sort of fictions of assimilation that said, if you know the language, if you know how to dress, if you can behave in such and such way, then you too can pass into this system. And you know, very occasionally we would have the sort of token representation in the House of Commons that would be the person of color or the reporter that would be the person of color, but as they open their mouth, they would be talking in, you know, without any trace of anything to do, not even a perspective, forget about accents, you know, that had anything to do with their cultures. And 
simultaneously, because everything works like that in conjunction, the whole process of immigration itself became conservatized, especially over the last decade. And so consequently, you, you had a privileging of class factors, a downplaying of refugees, and the numbers accepted of refugees declined, and instead you had the, the sort of like emphasis on the economic migrant that came in. And so the kind of immigration patterns that sort of like, you know, marked the country or marked the country for the last 10 years are immigrants who are extremely well-to-do, who can actually buy their way into the country, right? And who can show that they are willing to come in and they will invest X number of dollars into the country. And that's what makes immigration easier than the other way around. But with the conservatizing of immigration, what also happens is that when you put it into a context where you've got these ethnic enclaves already formed, you've got a privatized ethnicity that's working sort of within the context of the community, but that's not out there. You've got a sort of very strong public sphere that maintains an Anglo-dominant position. This kind of conservatizing only added, it compounded that situation. So that the kinds of consumption or the kinds of sort of culturalized ex expressions that were allowed were ones that were comfortable for this upper class immigrant coming in. They were not so concerned about, you know, the living culture or living it outside. For them, this is a transnational economy. They're coming in, they're investing, they're staying there. A lot of times they're experiencing the racism firsthand and it's, it's vicious. But one of the things that gives them an out is that they often go back. They go back to their countries, they actually live there, they make the money there, which then allows them to settle in Canada or have their children settle in Canada and grow up in Canada. And part of it is this whole notion of maintaining a space outside the home country in case something happens in the home country. Okay, that whole sort of, I call it the diasporic anxiety of living today. You never know where you're going to be kicked out of. So you're always looking for that other sort of option. And so that's the kind of sort of, you know, milieu. In the meantime, the, the, the immigrants, third generation immigrants that have been there have grown up in this privatized milieu as well and have grown up in that little necklace across the country with very little access to other forms of media. Now that's not to say that there is a thriving there isn't a thriving third force or a third uh, alternative that, that has emerged. It has. But the Canadian situation is very, very different from the American one. And I remember this morning when I was listening to NPR radio, and I was listening to some of the coverage, and I thought, you'd never get those stories over there. And you'd never get the stories over there because we don't have a tight foundation there. We don't have a system that supports that third sector. And in fact, it has been, up to this point, the government that has supported that third sector. And the government is gradually withdrawing from that arena, which means that without any kind of sort of foundations in there, without any kind of, you know, um, groups that, that can offer funding, it's very, very difficult for those independent voices to survive. So this is a kind of sort of general background to this country. But I want to talk particularly now about sort of mediations of race because this is where this um, stuff comes in. And, I, and I'm sorry, but this graph didn't come out. This is the representation of, um, in the original, which didn't translate very well in, in this particular slide, of the representation of, of um, journalists of color in the major newsrooms across the country. So what we have is um, representation on this side and the Canadian companies that were part of the census and the purple is the sort of the majority group that's represented and the pink is the minority journalists that, have be, that are in the newsrooms. And you can see the most recent is that last column and so what's happened is that the number of minority journalists and reporters has actually declined over the last 10 years. This is a survey based on, uh, on newsrooms across the country from 1994 to 2004. 
the issue with with this and what I and why I'm trying to bring the race issue up here is that one of the things that happens in the language of culture is that everything becomes culturalized. So that disadvantages that are based on issues of race don't really get recognized as such. And I want to give you a really sort of poignant example, and it hit me because I was right there in the room. I had been invited to adjudicate a competition for um, Multiculturalism Canada. And which had by this time become the Department of Heritage. So even the, the transformation of the names of this department are very telling. It, at one time it used to be uh, the Department of Immigration and War. Okay? And that's how it had started. So uh, in this Canadian Heritage Program, they had actually put out a call for video, uh, film and video proposals from cultural groups talking about their experiences. And so having known a little bit about this policy, when I went in to adjudicate these proposals, uh, jury them with, with the rest of the jurors, we were confronted with proposals that had come in from English Canadian filmmakers who wanted to make a film, which subsequently did get made, about the chil British children that had come to Canada during the time of war. So my argument at this table was, excuse me, but I thought, this competition was around visible minorities, culturalized or racialized cultural groups having access to tell their own stories. No, it turns out it was for every cultural group. So of course the British cultural group got recognized as a cultural group in its own right. This is the way in which the language of culture works. It actually dismantles the kinds of distinctions that are there that affect the lives and realities of people of color in their in living, in their, their very survival. So when you get, when you're denied a room to rent, right, or you're denied access to a particular thing on the basis of your culture, it very often has to do with the basis of your race. It doesn't have to do with culture. And the other thing that sort of like you can see the, the hollowness of the whole cultural paradigm is that just as in England you have a group called Asians which has everybody in it, right? It's one of these blanket terms. Well, in Canada, the blanket term is visible minority. It's got all people of color. But if you were to make finer, if you really were to talk in the language of culture, then you would say, you know, a cultural group like the Bengali Canadians like the Pakistani Canadians, like the Gujarati Canadians. But there is no recognition of that. It's basically you're an Asian. And in, in, in Canada, there is a particular term for Asian, which is called East Indian, which itself actually comes from the British East India Company, right? There's no such country as East India. But this term has become so legitimized that it's there in the Canadian census. You have a box that you can mark, are you East Indian? That's how culture gets collapsed. <coughs> India is a huge country with lots of cultures, but in Canada, culture is East Indian. The same thing with black culture. It's black. It's not Caribbean. It's not um, African American. It's not African Canadian, even though there have been attempts to try and reclaim that. It's basically black culture. The same thing with Chinese culture. And everybody who looks Asian is slotted in the Chinese culture. It doesn't matter that you're from Japan or you're from Korea, you're Asian. And that's how the Chinese category gets understood and constructed in everyday life. But these are your predominant visible minority groups. And so you have to sort of uncover that cultural language to really see that it's a racial, a racial designation that's at work. And really it's talking race, not talking culture. But what the cultural angle does is that it somehow legitimizes representations of particular groups in particular ways. And this is what I want to turn to next. I'm going to give you some of the examples that I have written about in other places just to, to talk about how the media refract the notion of race and how, in fact, culturalized racism gets understood. There was a case in, there, were, there have been several cases like this, but if there's a glaring example of the sort of preferred immigrant uh, in terms of the media's, there was an, a study done on the media's comparative treatment of refugees from Kosovo and refugees from Somalia. 
And it was very interesting because at that time I was actually taping uh, the TV broadcasts. So I got to see how the television news was actually representing these two groups. The refugees from Kosovo were actually given sort of carte blanche permission to enter into Canada at that time because of the situation there. The refugees from Somalia, same land size of these two countries, and Somalia was going through a famine, were only allowed in a small number. The refugees from Kosovo were embraced by the Canadian population that came out in droves with blankets, food, every, all kinds of things. The refugees from Somalia were not so kindly looked upon, okay? Were basically sort of like distanced and seen to be troublemakers, seen to not assimilate. Now, this is where you see, this is where my interpretation of race also sort of takes priority over religion because the refugees from Kosovo were Muslims as well. But Islamophobia had not surfaced to that great an extent at that time as it has now. And so consequently, it was blackness as a signifier that was seen to be the most problematic and was infused with signs of criminality and deviance, right? And the Somalis later on became and have continued to be a problematic community in the Canadian sort of media landscape. Another example that I have is a case that happened and that's been written about a lot called the Just Desserts case. And it involved a shooting in downtown Toronto in one of the upper sort of class areas in a dessert cafe um, of a white woman by two black men, as the media called them first, who uh, went in to rob this place. And this, this woman got shot. There was a lot made out, uh, uh, you know, made out about this case in the media, so much so that once the identity of the two assailants was described, they were then seen, uh, described as being Jamaican. Both of these men had lived in the country since they were 10 years old. They had grown up there. But they hadn't taken out citizenship in the country, which meant that they could be deported. And they were deported. One of them was deported. But the way in which the media seized this opportunity was that here are Jamaicans, this is using the cultural label now, the national label, and how Jamaicans and Jamaican men particularly are prone to criminalization, right? Um, need to be sort of our, our, our um, products of abandoned families, right? Because other men leave their, their job of fathering uh, the child. And so consequently have grown up like this and really why should Canada have to take care of them? And so they're deported back. Now, you know, one of the issues that came up in, um, in the earlier talk was what about this public sphere? Why is it important? Why are these kinds of representation important? Sure, we have a thriving black community. The Jamaican Canadian newspaper presented its own story of the, the event. <coughs> There were critical anti-racist writers who, who also wrote very critically about this, showing, in fact, that the number of black men that are also sort of incarcerated by the police is incredibly high in a place like Toronto. And if you look at the number of black men that have been shot by the police, it's also alarming. But none of that mattered. What mattered was what the mainstream media said, because that's what the policymakers listened to. And so consequently, in the following year, according to one research study, the number of deportations to Jamaica increased a hundredfold. All right? So that thing didn't end there. It actually had a spillover effect. The same thing happened with the Somalis. The same thing is happening elsewhere. The sort of deviantization of culture, all right? And I'm making the terms up as I go but it's the only way in which I can stretch the language to say what I wanted to say, becomes really problematic because it now becomes used as a foothold by which to define who can be granted legitimacy in the nation, who will be allowed entry into the nation, and who will be deported back out of the nation, right? So now we have a situation where even having a name like Muhammad becomes important as a signifier. It's not the fact that you could be Lebanese and look really fair. That doesn't matter. Everything has become culturalized, so religion has become culturalized in the same fashion. And so consequently, we had a situation where um, 
this was a couple of years ago, there was a story about a defunct business school in Ottawa, which had been attended by several sort of Middle Eastern and Pakistani students in their attempts to enter the country and to reside there. And so CSIS, are, which is the equivalent of the FBI, but it's much more secretive, we have absolutely no access to it, um, ended up saying that, all right, you know, some of these are terrorists. And so they went after this group and they arrested 24 guys whose first names were Muhammad. All right? So the Muhammads got arrested. And they argued that these, some of these Muhammads had been seen walking around a power plant in Pickering, Ontario. Well, when they went to the house, in fact, there was a filmmaker that tracked this story, went into the house and showed what these sort of like, you know, pictures from the power plants were, were basically pictures of tourists at all of the big sites in Toronto, like CN Tower, taking, having photographs taken of their place. But it didn't matter that they were sort of there being tourists. It was the fact that they were Mohammeds, that they looked South Asian, right? They were all South Asian male. That's how they looked that made them suspects that were arrested without any due process, isolated, and many of them deported. The problem with a situation like that, if you were to compare it to what happens elsewhere, and I'm thinking about how many of you know about the murder of Winston Choi in the States, in um, San Francisco, I think. Well, it happened around the sort of late 80s, I think. It was the murder of an Asian man which galvanized a whole response from all kinds of sort of like, you know, different anti-racist groups that, that took up this struggle to talk about why this man had been murdered and how he had been murdered. But here you have a situation in Canada where under the banner of culture, everything gets diffused, okay, and neutralized. So now it's like specific cultural groups that are considered to be problematic. And these cultural groups are then divided from the rest of the communities, which are then also simultaneously having turned inward and become privatized, unwilling to step forward and engage in a kind of coalitional politics for fear that the same thing will happen to them. So you have a situation now, post 9-11, where having a name like Mohammed is really dangerous, right? If your passport shows that you've been to Afghanistan, you better forget it. Don't even go there. And I, in fact, I've been to Cuba, and that was one of the reasons I was so afraid of crossing this border, because I thought they're going to look at this and say, Cuba, she must have been doing something over there. But there's a kind of sort of, the communities under, are under incredible surveillance. And consequently, there is a climate of terror. And it's a climate of terror that has been created by what I call the news media, the merchants of terror because they're the ones that have done this, right? They have perpetuated uh, an image of the sort of enemy within as the terrorist within, which anybody could become. Anybody becomes a signifier of that. But anybody who is in any way different, and this is where difference becomes a key element, because it's a difference that's <coughs> racialized. And in the case of Islam, it's a religion that has become racialized, because now it's linked to a particular part of the world. So it doesn't matter what culture you come from. You could be like, you know, a Malaysian Muslim, which is very different from being a Saudi Muslim. You know, you could be a non-practicing Muslim or a secular Muslim, or you could be a practicing Muslim. It doesn't matter. But the fact that you have a certain kind of name, the fact that you come from a particular part of the world, all of those signifiers sort of join, fuse together to make you a character that is considered to be dangerous to the nation. And therefore, you need to be contained or you need to be ex expelled from the nation. So one of the ways in which this kind of racism works is through inferential racism, which, as I saw some of you reading the quote before from Stuart Hall, is a way in which differences become naturalized. But more importantly, you don't really see the racist it's coded in such a way that you can't see the racist predicates of something until you take a closer look at it. And that's one of the problems, is that it's coded. Canadian racism is not in-your-face racism. It's a very polite racism, okay? It's not a racism that says, no, you can't come here. The only time you see that kind of racism is actually, as one of my grad students put it, is when you visit the chat rooms. 
And if you visit the gay chat rooms, there are rooms that will tell you no Asians allowed. All right? So Asian bodies are not to be allowed in this room. But generally, Canadian racism is the kind of racism that says uh, you apply for a job, you're granted an interview, and then at the interview you're told, I'm so sorry, but the job was just taken. Or I'm so sorry, the apartment was just let. Yeah? It's that kind of very polite racism. It's not in your face racism. And that's the, the sort of pattern across the country. But within Quebec, we have a different situation because Quebec owns its own sort of territory in, in a sense. It exercises its own power. And so its interpretation of multiculturalism, it doesn't subscribe to the dominant definitions of multiculturalism. It says instead that it offers a kind of interculturalism. And in the interculturalism, the rules are pretty clear. Either you join us or leave us. In other words, allow us to celebrate those aspects of your culture that we enjoy and that we can consume. So come on, bring your music, your dance, your food. We love it. Yeah? The exotica is like completely embraced. But don't bring us anything else. All right? So don't, don't wear your hijabs. Don't wear your kirpans because they're really problematic for us. You know, we can have, we, we separate out the church and state completely. So those are the conditions under which you can live in Quebec. And it's very open that way. Now, having said all of this as a backdrop, what happens in the case of gender? When gender and gendered violence enter into a terrain that has already been culturalized like that, refracted in that way, how does the media then construct gendered violence against women of color? And this is an area that I worked on for the last seven years as uh, having had uh, the opportunity to run a research center on violence against women and children. Well, one of the things that happens is, of course, something that uh, Uma Narayan, who is a scholar here, calls death by culture. These women die at the hands of their culture. Right? Their cultures are incredibly oppressive, and consequently, the only way in which these women can be rescued is if they leave their cultural homes or their cultural sort of traditions and assimilate into the dominant society, the fictions of assimilation. And some of the work that I've done in hospitals around this, particularly with the medical profession, is that they, for them, the preferred patient is the woman of color that's prepared to leave that. She's ready to be rescued. And if she can be rescued and you know, taken out of her sort of cultural milieu, then truly she is worth saving. Right? She can become like us. More often than not, just as, as um, Charlie was talking about arranged marriages, this is one of the things that happens in the dominant media. Deaths that occur. Uh, that in which women of color are involved and that have occurred in, in the case of sort of intimate violence are often attributed to cultural norms. So in other words, if a woman dies, and this is a case that happened in 96 uh, in British Columbia, where I was living at the time. It was a woman um, who, her name was Rajwar Gakal, and she had been married to this man only for about a year, and then she split up with him she left him, and she came back home to her parents, who obviously said to her, don't put up with that, come back, you know, come back home. And so she went back to Vernon, which was the, the place that her family lived in and had lived in for a long time. And um, her ex-husband was so incensed, and most violence actually happens after a woman leaves, right? When she's threatening to leave or she leaves, that's when the violence escalates. So he managed to get two gun permits, got two guns, drove from Vancouver to Vernon, and went in there and shot her and nine members of her family, okay, on the eve of her sister's wedding. The, the media labeled this the Vernon Massacre. And they labeled it a massacre based, and they argued in the first, the immediate coverage that came out, that this was a massacre just like the massacre that, ha that had happened in 1989 at the L'Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal when a man by the name of Marc Lapin went in there and shot 14 young women who were uh, engineering students. And he wrote how he hated women because they had taken up his space and so forth. 
And so this became, and every year, in fact, since 1989, there's been a commemoration of this event. And it was that event that actually fueled the federal government to put in some money into violence research. Until then, that point, it was a laughing matter, literally. And so they argued, oh, this Vernon massacre, we, you know, it's a massacre, it's huge. And um, you can see how this was an arranged marriage gone wrong, and it's all because of this arranged marriage, and this is a Sikh family. And throughout the coverage, all you got were references to the culture of the family, that this was a Sikh family. They had been sort of like credible members in the Gurudwara. There was a large East Indian community in Vernon. This was the second marriage was an arranged marriage as well. That was the sort of re theme throughout this coverage. It turned out that one of the things that had happened that actually then resulted in the death of these people is that the woman, Rajwar, had actually gone to the RCMP, this would be the equivalent of our federal police, and said, look, I'm getting threatened, I'm getting harassed, this guy is, says he's going to kill me, this is what he's going to do, can you do something to protect me? Nothing. They basically said that they shelved the complaint, or they put it aside because they thought, well, it's a cultural community, and she had expressed re reservations about this thing getting out because then everybody in the community would know. Close-knit, privatized communities, yeah? Well, that was all sort of like, you know, pushed aside, and the whole thing was sort of attributed to arranged marriages until six weeks later, this other woman comes forward. Her name is Sharon Valisak. Sharon Valisak doesn't belong to any identifiable cultural group, right? She is not a person of color. She, obviously, the name Velisak suggests a particular lineage and a particular ancestry. But that was never an issue that was picked up by the media. Turns out that Sharon Velisak had gone to the RCMP seven times and complained of her ex-boyfriend, Larry Scott, threatening her, and they did nothing. And it so happened that Larry Scott came in one day when Sharon Velisak had left him and he took a sawed-off shotgun, and he shot her, and then thinking that she was dead, because he went through her, uh, one of her lungs, shot himself and fell on top of her. And she survived. She actually lived to tell the tale. So in the coverage that followed after, there was no reference to any culture that you know, would explain why this situation had occurred and no reference, again, to sort of any kind of signifiers to suggest that Sharon Valisek had asked for it, except to say that there was the same invocation of a framing around violence, which is how gendered violence get explained, is through psychopathology. The man was mad, right? He just lost it. The, you know, he was enraged, and this is what happened. So you have two situations around the same, same, within the same geographic area. One, a person of, woman of color, and the other, a white woman that's involved. Who gets the airplay? Who gets the legitimacy? Whose issue is actually seen to be a valid issue of the lack of police intervention? Well, it wasn't Rajwa Gakal. It was Sharon Valasek. And her issue is the one that galvanized the Attorney General's office to actually launch an inquiry into how the RCMP dealt with violence. So here you get the, the sort of like invocation of death by culture as a ready-made phenomena that you know, can be used to explain away violence. When in fact, if you look at the stats, we have a situation of something like 3.4 wives that are killed to every man that is, a kill, that is murdered in the case of family violence in Canada every year, right? Like in a year, we have about, I would say, 20 to 60 women that die. It, it used to be 60, it's gone down. But it's interesting that it's gone down and the cases of criminal harassment have actually gone up. So things like stalking have gone up, but the homicide rate's gone down. So how sort of culture gets used to explain away things becomes really strategic. And that's the sort of dangerous part because this is where something that doesn't have to do with culture, because ultimately, you know, there's a woman, Christine Rash, who says, a blow to your face is a blow, no matter whether it's accompanied by words in, in Arabic or words in English, it's still a blow to your face. There's a whole corporeal dimension of violence that you cannot remove, yeah? 
So the argument is that it doesn't matter what language it's said in, it's the fact that it is a violation that needs to be attended to, and that's what gets erased. That in the coverage of all of these issues, the issue of culture not only gets nominated as the explanatory framework or the paradigm through which things are explained away, or gets used to sort of take away attention from race, right? Importantly and very strategically, or in some cases gets erased completely. No one said that this girl was murdered because of racism. Even though she was a brown girl that had been attacked and killed in the most horrible fashion by two white youth, it didn't matter. It was always explained away as a case of girl-on-girl -girl violence in one case or bullying in the other. And so all of the issues around the racism that she encountered her otherness that she was continually forced to reside in, all of those factors were completely erased from the picture. And in effect, what she became was the poster child of bullying. So here's a situation where not only do you get culture being used in that way, but you also get race erased in the process. And if, if there is one discourse of denial that I can totally sort of condemn Canada on, and it is something that the Aboriginal communities have constantly called attention to, it's the fact that there is a major culture of denial that's operating there. Because it's a culture that refuses to come face to face with the reality of race. And it refuses to come face to face with the kinds of sort of operate, uh, the, the subjugations and the subordinations that it carries on in the name of multiculturalism. And I'll end there. Thank you.